So this is a video I've been planning on making for a while now, well over a year, and it's been one of the most asked for. One of the issues I had making the video is that the topic is so broad. On top of that, the information on how exactly these systems work is highly classified, especially with the newest equipment. Electronic Warfare, or EW as you'll often hear it called, can be broken up into several categories, but most broadly, it is the use of any of the electromagnetic spectrum in an attack. The electromagnetic spectrum includes everything from x-rays, to visible light, to infrared and microwaves, and radio waves. They are all the exact same thing, the only difference between them is the wavelength. Electronic warfare can be broken down into three categories. ECM, or Electronic Countermeasures, ECCM, Electronic Counter Countermeasures, and ESM, Electronic Support Measures. The first category, ECM, is what most people think of, jamming. Jamming is done to degrade the enemy's ability to collect and exchange information, therefore limit their ability to attack or defend against your attack. For example, jamming an enemy radar to interfere with their ability to communicate with each other or jamming a radar so that they cannot obtain usable information from that radar. One of the most simple and low-tech versions of this is chaff. While it is technically mechanical and not electronic, it is sometimes included in the category of electronic warfare, and I believe worth discussing. Chaff typically consists of thin strips of aluminum that is dropped from an aircraft or launched up into the air. These strips reflect radar waves, creating a whole mess of radar returns, making it difficult to know which return is the real target. And I think it brings up an important point. Jamming, and EW in general, will not necessarily make you invisible. The enemy will still know you are there. In fact, jamming will often alert the enemy that you are there, somewhere. Instead, the purpose of it is to overwhelm the enemy's sensors, so that it cannot distinguish between what is a real target, or return, and what is not. So going back to Chef, it is often used to distract radar-guided missiles, whether they be anti-ship missiles or anti-air missiles, by showing them another target, which they will hopefully go after instead of the real target. Chef has been used extensively ever since the development of radar, and is still used regularly today. Along the same lines as Chef are decoys. Decoys are objects that can be launched and again present the enemy with another target, some modern aircraft carry several decoys, which can be deployed in the hopes of the enemy missile hitting it instead of the aircraft. An example of this is the ALE-50 towed decoy system, carried by US aircraft like the F-16, FA-18, and the B-1 bomber, and has reportedly been successfully used in combat. Another type of decoy are pretty much small, unmanned aircraft themselves which are launched from an aircraft and can fly off themselves, attracting the attention of the enemy and the enemy's fire. Weapons like MALT, or the miniature air launch decoy, is an example. Some of these decoys can emit radio waves as well, copying that of manned aircraft to further deceive an enemy into thinking that the decoy is an actual manned aircraft. There is also a jamming version of the MALT, called the MALT-J. This decoy is able to actively jam enemy radars, as well as acting as a decoy. The next is arguably the more exciting method of electronic warfare. That is jamming by actively sending out your own signals. This has been around for a while, but really took off during the Cold War. Now there are many, many methods of doing this, way too many to adequately cover here. Also, techniques and methods have changed with the advent of things like phased array radar, which these methods, as they are still relatively newer, are highly classified. In fact, you could say that they are some of the most closely held secrets today. But we know some of the basic techniques. Most simplistically, a radar will emit a signal and bounce off an aircraft and return to the radar. From the time this takes, it'll know exactly how far away the aircraft is from the radar. When jamming, the aircraft is actively emitting signals back to the enemy radar itself so that the enemy does not know if the signals it is receiving are theirs or fake ones. So if it was a surface-to-air missile sight radar, the jamming aircraft would send back signals, at the same frequency, to the radar. Some may arrive earlier, some later, than the real return. 
Since the radar uses the time it takes for a signal to return to calculate the range, an aircraft jamming would appear to constantly change distances. Also, depending on the type of radar, jamming in this manner can also create the appearance of the aircraft being on different bearings as well. As the radar rotates, it is looking in different directions for aircraft. If the jammer sends a signal when the radar is pointed in a different direction, it will appear to the radar that there is an aircraft in that direction. With the two of these combined, a radar will get returns from all different distances and in different directions. The point of doing this is to hopefully not allow the radar to calculate a firing solution, as it cannot pinpoint the aircraft's location. A similar method can be used to also jam airborne radars. Here is a quick clip from a game called DCS showing a similar pattern as before. The radar is getting many returns and cannot pinpoint the distance of the jamming aircraft. Radio waves are subject to the inverse square law, meaning that if you double the distance, the power is four times less. So in jamming, it's important to have a very powerful system. With radar, the signal is subject to the inverse fourth power, as the signal has to travel from the radar, bounce off the object, and then return back to the radar. Because of this, when an aircraft is attempting to jam a radar, whether it is a ground-based radar for a SAM system or against another aircraft, jamming is more effective from a distance. As the two get closer, there is a point where the radar return exceeds the power of the jamming. This is called burn-through, at which point the jamming is in essence useless. Another method is to jam communications. This has become somewhat less effective in modern days, but works by blasting radio signals on the same frequency to create interference. Like somebody shouting while you're trying to talk, so that the other person cannot make out what you are saying. This method can be used with voice communications, so that the two enemy units cannot communicate, or even on wireless networks exchanging data packets. Russia in general has invested much into jamming. One interesting system is called the Murmansk BN. The system is a large, very powerful electronic warfare platform that has the ability to monitor or jam wireless communications over a very long distance. Russia claims it has a range of 3,000 kilometers and up to 5,000 under ideal situations, like weather. Four of these systems can be seen just south of Sevastopol, Crimea. If those ranges are to be believed, that would cover all of Europe and the entire Middle East but even with more conservative estimates of the range, it can cause serious issues for militaries operating in the Black Sea and most, if not all, of Ukraine. Jamming GPS is another major one in modern warfare, and jamming GPS signals is not that difficult. The relatively weak signals meant that even back during the Gulf War, when GPS was brand new, several Iraqi units were able to disrupt the system with fairly inexpensive and crude electronics. Events recently in Syria have shown just how susceptible GPS is to jamming. There have also been many reports in places like Norway, where Russia has been interfering with GPS navigation. And this isn't limited just to GPS, but all navigational satellite systems. Be it Russia's GLONASS or China's Beidou 2, they are all susceptible to jamming. And the issue is, many modern weapons are reliant on these systems for guidance. It's a major problem in modern warfare, the over-reliance on modern technology. This fact has not gone unnoticed though. Many weapons have more than one form of guidance. For example, the newest Stormbreaker, or SDB-2 Glide Bomb, uses both GPS and inertial guidance, along with active radar and infrared homing. Jamming, and electronic warfare in general, has been a field that has seen much research into recently, with the rise of drones. There are the more famous examples, like when Iran managed to bring down the US RQ-170 in 2011. But with the rise of small, cheap consumer drones, co-opted for military use, it has become a real problem. These drones can be packed with explosives, and their small size and low cost means that they pose a threat to targets generally considered to be safe. In August of 2018, the president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, was nearly assassinated by two drones armed with explosives while he was giving a speech. And just recently, Heathrow Airport in London was shut down after drones were sighted. 
creating a risk to airplanes. So defending against these threats had become vital. These drones can cost a couple hundred dollars, while air defense systems can cost tens, even hundreds of thousands of dollars per missile. Finding a way of jamming these drones, therefore, has become a priority. Russia has been known to operate such equipment, and has used it to defend their air base in Syria. And advanced Russian systems have been appearing in eastern Ukraine as well, disabling Ukrainian government drones conducting reconnaissance. Other, less well-known forms of jamming are used regularly. The US presidential motorcade carries radio jammers to make coordinating any attack much more difficult, and can't be seen any time the president is traveling. Counter countermeasures have also been devised to defeat or mitigate the effects of electronic warfare. This falls into the category of ECCM. One such method is to use weapons that could home in on the jamming signal. These guidance systems, instead of emitting a signal, will pick up the jamming and follow it as it gets stronger until it reaches the location that it is being broadcasted from. Another method includes constantly changing the frequencies of the radar. This way, a jammer would have a much more difficult time knowing which frequency to jam, or force the jammer to jam many different frequencies at once, which spreads out the jammer's power, weakening it on any individual frequency. AESA radars are a good example of this. Older radars could not easily change their frequency, therefore making the jammer's job much easier, as it knew which frequency the target would be operating on. AESA radars are electronic, and can easily shift frequencies. This greatly increases the difficulty in jamming them. Modern radars have made jamming much more difficult as well, as their computing and processing power has increased exponentially, allowing them to detect minute differences in signals and identify which signals are real and which ones are false. Also, other forms of sensors and guidance can negate radar jamming. For example, infrared search and track, or IRST. These can be used to detect and track targets that are either jamming or are stealthy, which make them harder to detect on radar. Although they do have some downsides, weather can impact their performance, and they do not have as long of a range as radar. Russia is known to use many of these IRST systems on their aircraft, surface-to-air missile systems, and also operate long-range IR missiles. And that brings up another topic. Most of this video have discussed electronic warfare pertaining to radar and radio waves. But EW encompasses the entire EM spectrum, that includes visual and infrared. While these areas have not been exploited to the same level as radio waves, there are some systems operational. One example is the ALQ-144. Over 8,000 of the 144 and its upgrades and variants have been built and is used by more than 20 nations. The system protects against IR-guided missiles, such as manpads, by radiating controlled pulses of infrared energy. Another system uses lasers, which are aimed at the incoming missile's seeker head, and steer them away from the target. Also, although it is again mechanical, flares are used to throw off IR-guided weapons and sensors. Like chaff, they are typically dropped from aircraft, they work by creating a powerful IR signal, which hopefully the incoming missile will lock onto instead of your aircraft. And the final category is ESM, or Electronic Support Measures. This term can often be used interchangeably with ELINT, or Electronic Intelligence. It is collecting information from radar, radio communications, and any other system that emits a signal, and using that information to detect classify, analyze, and even spy on a potential enemy. Doing this can give you information such as what frequencies are being used, so that you can prepare a defense, such as jamming. You probably heard in the news in the last few years, stories about how a US spy plane was intercepted in the Black Sea by Russian interceptor aircraft, or in the South China Sea by Chinese fighters. These events happen semi-regularly. This is what these aircraft are doing, ELINT or ESM missions, collecting and analyzing emissions from radars and other radio communications. These tasks aren't only carried out by aircraft though. The Murmansk BN I discussed earlier has the ability to conduct ELIN. These types of missions have been going on for decades. In fact, just before the start of World War II, 
in the late 1930s, the Germans noticed England was constructing large masts along the coast. Germany at the time was working on developing their own form of radar, and believed it was possible that the British were deploying such a system. The Germans took a Zeppelin, loaded it with sensitive electronics, and flew it up and down the coast, listening for any emissions from the masts. These could be considered the first airborne ELINT missions. But the flights failed to detect any signs of an active radar system. As it turns out, the British did have an active radar system, called Chain Home, and the Germans had their sensors set to the wrong frequency. There are some historians who argue that this mistake could have changed the course of the war. In the late stages of the Battle of Britain, the Germans could not believe how many fighter aircraft England seemed to have. They seemed to be everywhere, every time the German bombers flew on bombing missions. When in reality, England was running extremely low on usable aircraft. Germany eventually ended the battle, not knowing how close they had come to winning, and the fact that England had very few aircraft remaining, but were able to use them much more effectively with the radar able to vector them. Had Germany continued the battle, they might have won, which could have led to an invasion of England, and possibly changed the course of World War II entirely. Now obviously it's impossible to prove that, but it's interesting to think about. But it highlights the importance of ELINT, ESM, and electronic warfare overall. Modern warfare and technology has created an entire new battlefield, in which each side must fight. NATO actually classifies electronic warfare as its own warfighting environment or domain, just as they fight in any other environment, such as on land, air, sea, and space. And I just want to take a second to again thank my supporters on Patreon. It really is incredible the support you give. Thank you so much. Also, you know I try hard to stay out of politics, but it's come to my attention that there are some people upset with Patreon's policies and recent actions, and have requested that I also set up an account on an alternative crowdfunding site. If anyone has any suggestions of a good alternative, please let me know. I will not be deleting the Patreon, just setting up another account for those who would rather not use Patreon. In the meantime, I have also created a PayPal account set up for donations. Any support you guys could give me there is greatly, greatly appreciated. Even if it's the lowest amount, your help really goes a long way to allowing me to keep making videos and devoting more and more of my time to the channel. Thank you again.